I'll go ahead. Quick introduction. Um, I actually went to grad school with Alex, so I know him from way back when we were. Um, um, okay. um, but anyway, Alex is a um, really professor of computer science at Stanford. Works on all sorts of interesting issues related to programming languages and software systems, and he's here to talk to us about using influence. Yeah. So didn't Obama like outlaw that? Yeah, I know. Well, right. Uh, thanks a lot, Bill. Uh, is this mic on? I don't know. If, no, I have no idea. Okay. Yeah, if you can hear me fine, then I won't worry about it. But um, so today we're going to talk about uh, uh, debugging in a in a production context, and uh, a couple of things we're going to touch on are anomaly signals, uh, something we call the structure of influence graph and influence, and then a a bug in a particular robot that you may have heard of, Stanford's uh, robotic car that we we uh, we worked on uh, using these techniques. Um, the context for the talk uh, is that we really want to get a handle on how we can make better use of the information that we already gather about production systems. So there's a tremendous amount of log data that's generally gathered um, when, when people run systems in production. And, uh, and it's our feeling that a lot of this uh, information is not adequately uh, mined or used and that we could do a better job of, uh, of extracting useful information from it. And, and we do one case study at the end of the talk where I'll actually hopefully prove that point to you. Um, but our model of a, of a typical system is something like this. You have uh, some kind of uh, inputs on the, on the left and outputs on the right. And then there's a cloud in the middle with all kinds of stuff in it. And the inputs go into the cloud and stuff comes out and it's not really clear what's going on. And every now and again a uh, unhappy thing happens where you know, a bad output arises and then usually it falls to some uh, either engineer or uh, system administrator to try to figure out why did that bad thing happen. Okay. So if we drill down one level, if we look inside the cloud, you know, in there is some kind of complicated system. It has all kinds of components um, that can talk to each other. And you know, some of the features typically are there's going to be feedback loops uh, in the system. Um, there'll be resource sharing, so there'll be uh, dependencies between components that are not explicit, but only uh, because they share a resource and are competing for that resource. And furthermore, there'll be, there'll be some subclouds. There'll be pieces in there that we don't have control over that we can't actually go in and look at ourselves, code we got from other, uh, from, uh, from other organizations, uh, whole systems that we've purchased and you know, run as part of our organization. And so we have, uh, there, there, are, there are places in there where we don't have, oops, excuse me, no problem. There are places in there where we don't have complete information about what's going on in the system. And furthermore, uh, we have some data that we're gathering, uh, log data typically, um, but some kind of signals that we're taking out, but not, not for all the components. And different components have different quality and amounts of log data. So the data will be noisy and also uh, incomplete. All right, so that's the setting. So just to, to try to, to make this uh, as clear as possible, we're really interested in taking the system as it is uh, with these kinds of constraints and trying to see if we can make more use of the available information that's coming out when there is a problem to help diagnose those problems. All right, so what are the challenges? Uh, well, so as you already said, there's measurement noise and imprecision. Uh, there's missing components and interactions. Generally, these systems are complicated and very large. Uh, and, and then the data, the information that we're actually gathering from the different components it can be of any kind. So there's you know, different kinds of data, different semantics to the data. And we need some way to, uh, to systematize that and make sense of it. So this is not a new problem. Um, people have looked at this uh, in the past. Uh, but the typical solution has been to change the problem a little bit. And almost all the solutions that you see, uh, actually I think all the other solutions that you see, uh, essentially boil down to adding some kind of instrumentation to make the problem a little bit easier to solve. And we're all for instrumentation. Uh, and don't, uh, don't object to that in principle. And I've certainly worked on a lot of projects where we were happy to add instrumentation. Um, but there's an issue there, which is that you can't really get past this problem that you're going to have pieces that you just don't know anything about because they're not yours. And so there's always going to be components in there. There's going to be some level of abstraction below which you can't look. And if you, if you assume that you can add enough instrumentation to make all the dependencies explicit, which is what these other systems do, 
then uh, this inevitably doesn't scale up uh, at some point because you have some building block where you just can't do that. You just can't break it down, all right? And so if we assume that there will always be these clouds, these pieces that we don't know the structure of in our systems, what can we do? Uh, because we can't figure out what the input-output relationship here is. We can't see what on this side affects what on that side. There's, you know, we, just, we just can't look inside. And what kinds of techniques can we bring to bear to deal with that problem? All right? And this is really the organizing idea for, for what we're doing, uh, which is to use statistics. And so instead of trying to explicitly uh, go off of the, uh, instead of trying to build upon explicitly given dependencies, we're going to use, uh, we're going to turn our, our weakness here into, an, into a strength by using statistical information about well, what happens on the left and what happens on the right to infer uh, the correlation. Okay, it will not allow us to get, we won't be able to get dependencies out of that, but we can certainly get valid statistical correlation if we do things right. Okay, and this is different from dependencies. Um, and we're going to build up everything uh, using statistical correlation rather than dependencies. And, uh, and this will lead to a different kind of output. So you will see that uh, we have um, different kinds of effects than you get when you actually have an explicit uh, dependency graph. For example, um, we might have bidirectional correlations. We might not be able to tell what the direction of influence is between two components because they seem to mutually affect each other. And so we might just wind up with a bidirectional edge uh, eventually saying, you know, these two components are somehow locked together, but we don't know exactly what the path of data flow is between them. All right, so how can we, so, so the rest of the talk is gonna be about how we compute influence. And uh, we're gonna start out by talking about anomalies and then how we do the correlation in time and space. And finally, uh, how we actually do the inference. So if we want to compute correlation uh, between components where we don't really know how they're connected up, you know, what kinds of hooks do we have? Because all we see is a signal coming out of one component, signals going into coming out of other components. Where do we have some kind of leverage where we can see what the one opponent component is affecting another? And remember, we don't assume we know the structure in between. Well, so one thing we can do is to look at anomalies. So where something happens that's strange on one component, something that's very different from the abnormal behavior, we could then look at the other components and see if they respond with anomalies in uh, some kind of relationship that we can understand. So if component A hiccups at time t and uh, component B hiccups at time t plus one, and that happens for many different times, okay, every time opponent, component A hiccups, component B eventually hiccups, we can begin to infer there is some relationship between them, okay? So we're, gonna, we're going to uh, compute these things called anomaly signals, uh, and this is gonna be our model of individual components. So all we're gonna do is, uh, is map every component's behavior, its log file, whatever signal we're gathering from it, to some kind of a stream that measures how different its current behavior is from its, from its global behavior. All right, and that just gives a, at every point in time, we'll have a measure of surprise how unusual the behavior of that component is currently, you know, uh, compared to what it has done uh, in the past. All right, so here's an example, anomaly signal just mapped out over time. And then we'll use a standard statistical technique, cross-correlation. We'll take these signals from different components and we'll cross-correlate them. And that will give us some notion of whether there is any, first of all, correlation between the components. And in addition, it'll give us some idea of what the time lag is between them. So for example here, um, if this is the cross-correlation graph between the signals for component I and component J, is my pointer working? Yes. This, what this signal says is that there is a peak here where component I, uh, a comp component I signal is highly, component I's anomaly signal is highly com uh, correlated with component J's anomaly signal with this much delay. So component I goes first, something unusual happens on component I, and then after this amount of time, there's often something unusual happening on component, uh, component J. All right, and that's how you compute the cross-correlation, uh, but that's uh, not so important as what it actually does, all right, as the intuition. Then how are we gonna make use of this information? So one idea, um, these signals actually, I'll show you some actual anomaly signals later, uh, but these graphs are very, very busy, and they extend for long, long periods of time. 
So we're going to add, introduce a threshold parameter saying if the cross-correlation at any point, if there's a peak that's above a certain threshold, then we're going to say that component I and component J have a relationship, that there is, a, there is an influence between them. And that will lead to these graphs, okay? Uh, we'll have graphs of influence where the edges mean that there, w that there is an influence that exceeds some threshold between them and the delay gives us the directionality of the edge, all right? And it's quite possible, just to point out, that we'll get you know, directed uh, it, and it will turn out, I'll explain how we decide what kind of edge later, but we'll wind up having very uh, arbitrary kinds of graphs. The graphs could be, have directed edges, bidirectional edges, undirected edges, and also you know, components might not, have, might not share influence with other components, in which case they will be disconnected from the graph. All right. So now let me tell you, that's a high level sketch of how we're going to do this, and let me tell you a little bit about how we compute uh, the anomaly signals, and then I'll just walk through the different pieces. The anomaly signals, uh, the influence, and then finally the graphs, and, and, and then some examples. So again, anomaly signals just surprise over time. How unusual is the current behavior? And uh, because it's a measurement over time, we need some kind of time-stamped signal. So that's one assumption we do make, is that we have information with uh, time on it, okay? And that's a pretty often satisfied assumption about the kinds of signals that you gather from, uh, from real systems. And in fact, we're going to go even further than that. We're just going to focus on the timestamps. We're not even going to look, for the most part, at the contents of the log. Um, uh, all the examples we've done so far, the only bit that we actually use is the time. And I'll show you how we do that right now. Okay, so why use timing? Well, timing is a pretty universal signal. You can get it from most components. If you're gathering any information at all, you generally have time. And so it's a ubiquitous signal. And uh, it often carries other information, and information that's hard to get from other kinds of tools. So let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, here's a little um, chart showing how long it takes an HTTP server to process different kinds of pages. All right, so what this, the point of this is so there's one there for HTML, one for uh, PHP, and one for a, just the time to serve a 404 not found page, okay? So that's a distribution of times, and the point is that if I just tell you the time that it took to serve the page, you already know a lot about what kind of a page it was, all right? So there is semantic information encoded in those timings. Similarly, um, t I mentioned that we're going to deal with shared resources, so the ability to actually you know, infer influence even if it's, there's no direct edge, but it's just competition for a resource. Here's an example of that and how timing can help. If I have uh, pairs of processes just trying to talk over a socket, here's the timing for them to succeed in having uh, an exchange of packets just based on how many pairs are sharing the socket. And as you would expect, if there's a single pair talking on the socket, you know, the packets go through fairly quickly, but if I have lots of pairs talking on the socket, the distribution is heavily shifted to the right. And so again, the timing uh, of the results on this particular shared resource carries a lot of information about, about what was going on at the time uh, on that particular resource. So here's our model. Here's how we uh, look at time. So we're, gonna, we're actually going to look at the inter-arrival times of messages in our signal, in our log file, for example. So we look at the difference in timestamps. So between the time from one thing appearing in the log to the time of the next thing appearing in the log. And we'll need a historical distribution, the second line there. That represents what's normal. Okay, so I'd say it's like an average over a past log or over the entire log, uh, the current log if we're doing this retrospectively. And then we need a recent distribution. So, so, so over some time window, uh, over some local window, just what's the current distribution? All right, and then all this is doing, this is the KL divergence. It's a standard information theoretic quantity, but let me just you know, say, if you haven't seen it before, let me just say a little bit about what it does. So you know, we, we're, we're looking at the current window and you know, how much information is in there. So what were the, uh, the distribution of uh, inter inter arrival times, you know, this over some local, very, you know, uh, sorry, sorry, short period of history, and then we're uh, we're just normalizing that sum by how much information there is there relative to the historical uh, uh, distribution. So if the if the recent distribution is very different from the historical distribution, this term over here will bump up the score, and if it's very similar to the historical distribution, then 
as you will see, you know, these numbers will be close to one. Log of ba base two of one is going to be close to zero, and those terms will be uh, will will tend to be very low. Okay, and so this is just uh, you know the current scores weighted by how much they vary uh, compared to the historical scores. All right. Okay. So what are the parameters in that model? Um, well, there's a window size. We have to talk about how much recent history we're going to look at. And uh, that uh, you know, affects tolerance to, noise, uh, to, to delay noise and, and how sensitive we are to small anomalies. Okay, so if, there's a very, very, if we have a very short window, then we're very sensitive to small perturbations in the anomaly signal. If we use a big window, then we're much less sensitive except to very, very large anomalies. And then uh, the bin width, okay, so what we consider to be distinct. So, uh, so how, how wide we make our... Uh, what, how, how, how we group the anomaly scores together. Okay, and we use heuristics for those. There are well-known heuristics uh, for, for determining these things, and uh, we just use standard uh, techniques for that. So um, the signal distribution then is going to look uh, often something like this. Okay, so because we want uh, these to be anomalies, so we, I mean, the, the whole purpose of this, uh, of this model is to capture the unusual behavior, most of the behavior is going to be grouped um, around scores that are not unusual at all. Okay, so there's going to be a big peak just for normal behavior. And then hopefully, because our technique kind of depends on having some anomalies in order to uh, gain a foothold for determining where the correlations are, uh, there'll be some anomalies uh, you know, at a, uh, somewhere else in the graph. And this is sort of a typical distribution where it's bimodal. So you have your normal behavior, and then every now and again something odd happens, and there's another peak way out here, you know, distinctly separated from uh, the normal behavior. And actually, this is actually not so unusual uh, a graph to see uh, for a lot of components. All right. Okay, so here's some actual anomaly signals um, taken from uh, a robot. And it's not so important uh, what uh, they are. They are. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly complicated system. Actually, we'll talk about this system again later. Um, and this is not all of the components in it. But one thing that's kind of interesting, just visually, is how different the different signals are. I mean, so it's very, very different uh, patterns. But if you were to stare at this for a while, and let me uh, speed things up for you, and to look at these signals, you would see that there are some groups that seem to have similar structure. So all of these components seem to be somewhat related, okay, and that they have spikes in uh, a similar uh, pattern. Um, a couple of components here that seem to bear some relationship to each other. There's a big drop at some point uh, that seems to be correlated in time. And a little harder to see, but there is something going on in these. I mean, you can see there's a very similar pattern between those two, at least in the first part of the graph. All right. So what we're going to do now is try to figure out what these, uh, we're, trying to find, we're going to try to discover those automatically, okay? And I'll talk about that next. All right, so now, structure of influence graphs, or SIGs, as we call them. So I mentioned before that we're going to use cross-correlation uh, to identify correlated anomalies. And so cross-correlation, if you've never seen it before, it just does exactly what, it, uh, what we want. It compares two signals and says whether there's any correlation to them, perhaps with some offset. And the cross-correlation essentially tries all the possible offsets and picks the one that gives the largest, uh, the largest correlation. And, that, and it gives the magnitude of the correlation and also the delay. Now, I mentioned before we'll use this parameter epsilon to determine when the correlation exceeds a significant threshold that we want to have an edge in our graph. But we'll actually use another parameter, alpha, uh, here, that's a delta from zero or a distance from zero, and that's the uh, threshold we'll use to determine what direction the edge should have. Right. So, if the edge is within the band minus alpha to positive alpha, if that's where the peak is of the cross correlation, then we'll say there's essentially no delay between them, and we'll have an undirected edge. Okay. If it's on either side then we'll have an edge in that direction. And if there's a peak on both sides, uh, then we'll have a bidirectional edge. Okay, so that's the interpretation of what the edges mean. All right. 
So there's going to be one vertex per component in our graph, and then the edges summarize the cross-correlation. shows you where there was a significant cross-correlation exceeding epsilon, and then the direction of the edge tells you uh, where the peak is uh, or how many peaks there are in the case of a bidirectional edge. All right. Okay. All right. So that's just a summary of what I just said. Okay. So what's the interpretation of this? So, so adjacent components in the graph, graph uh, components that are connected by an edge, um, share some kind of an influence. Uh, so in this graph, we would say that you know, A precedes B, so anomalies on A precede anomalies in B. Uh, a and D are roughly simultaneous. And D and E, that's kind of an interesting case when you have these bidirectional edges. Uh, either there's really, uh, they, they really both influence the other, but another common uh, pattern that you see is that they're periodic. So if you think of D being a sine wave and E being a cosine wave, then the, you know, the, the peaks on, in anomalies on D and E uh, are offset by some amount, but they oscillate between one and the other. Well, I understand periodic, but I don't think I understand both of each other. I'm sorry? Well, it could be, I'm sorry, so there could be a, so it could be a periodic behavior right. that where, where, you know, something happens on A, that causes something to happen on B, that causes okay. feedback, something happened on A. Okay, so that's, that's one way in which they can influence each other. The other case might be that there just was some point in time where something happened on A, and that caused something to happen on B. Okay? And then another point in time, oh. independent, something happened on B, and that actually caused something to happen on A, but it wasn't a cyclic thing where it just you know, happened over and over and over again. But these were actually, I, I don't think I said it very well. These were actually just in discrete well, events. Cases, they both depend on C. Huh? Well, cases, they both depend yes, and I haven't talked about that yet, but that is something that's going to be very interesting when we get to our examples, because uh, you spoiled my surprise, <laughs> which is that often looking at these graphs, you can, because remember, we, we work on systems where we don't know all the components. We don't assume we know the whole system. But often you can spot in the graph where there is another component you're not modeling. Because you'll see a whole bunch of influence tightly connected among components that, where you know there's no connections between them. And what that tells you is there's somebody else that you're not seeing who's affecting all of these. That's not in the model. Yeah. So um, another thing here from this example, um, if A and B are highly correlated, but there's no edge from D to B, right? Is that just because the margin? Yeah. They are only roughly correlated and it doesn't quite meet the threshold? Well, you can't tell just by looking at one graph, that but that would be an example, right. And one thing you can do is, uh, and actually our current interface doesn't support this, but we uh, have, um, have proposed, you know, we plan to do this at some point, is you actually vary that threshold with a slider and you can see the edges come and go. So you get a feeling for, you know, where the, the best graph is. I mean, so you, you kind of like to get a graph with a reasonable number of edges. And so you would want to set that epsilon automatically you know, to sort of show the most important edges. I, I right. thought maybe you removed transitive edges, but is that not something? No, we don't remove transitive edges, yeah. No. yeah. Okay? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we actually tried to do something with that in Google. Uh huh? Some, some of the groups, they were very unsuccessful. And, uh, but it's interesting, you know, in Google, when you think about the components, often the case that A plus B is parallel to C, but neither A is parallel to C. Right. Right. So then you get this explosion. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I mean we're partly we're here. Partly we're here on a fishing expedition, because we would like. I mean, and, and this is explicit in the abstract. You know, to to drive this kind of stuff, we need a lot of data. And and from realistic systems. And so, if there is interest, I'd be, I'd love to talk after the talk to, to anybody who who would be willing to try this out. And you know, of course, we'd be willing to do most of the work. We just need the data set. Yeah. I didn't understand it quite. I couldn't follow it fast enough. Sorry. Okay. Um, can you so we got three components, A, B, and C. Can you determine when the influence of A over C is mediated entirely through the influence of B? Uh, so, so it's. Um, when you say mediated, what do you mean? I mean um, that, that, that A does not directly influence C, but A. Yeah, so partly we're doing statistical correlation. So we will find the correlations even if there's no explicit dependency. So we will. Uh, but, but you would see in that case, if there's really a chain of dependency, you would see A influences B, B influences C, and then a separate edge, A influences C. Okay? That's how you would... I don't like to remove that edge because it's exclusively factoring through 
we wouldn't do that right now. I mean, I don't know why we couldn't do that. Um, but just the semantics of what this means, it means that, you know, whether there's a correlation or not. And there is additional information in knowing that A influences C because the influence may be either magnified or damped by passing through B. And so the presence or absence of that edge from A to C actually tells you something that you don't get just by having the two edges A to B and B to C. Uh, yeah, so the question was, uh, uh, what about transitive edges? Uh, I think I can summarize it that way. If I have A influences B and B influences C, you know, why would I want the edge A influences C? Okay. All right. Okay. All right, so um, continuing on. Uh, the meaning of the graph structure, uh, if we have a clique, and this is actually the, the thing I wanted to talk about, uh, if it, so, so often you can tell things about the system uh, from the structure of the graph. So if you see a clique in the graph, that, for example, is often an indication of a shared resource. Okay, so there may be the case that these guys don't actually have a dependency between each other, they don't actually talk to each other, but they're all competing for the same resource. And the fact that there's a clique indicates that when there's a lot of contention, they all influence each other because you know, one guy getting in there and getting it stops the other ones from, from doing their job. And of course, it, since it's completely symmetric, the edges will be from every one to every other one. All right, and or, or an unmodeled component is another possibility in that situation. And there are other graph structures that suggest interesting things, but cliques are one of the most important and easiest to uh, 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 give intuition for in a short talk. All right, all right now influence. So um, one thing we wanted to understand was how influence propagates. So certainly uh, influence includes things like functional dependencies. So if uh, A is taking input from B, uh, then, then you, ex you would expect to see B have an influence on A. Uh, but there are other ki situations in which there's influence, like shared resources and such. And so how does influence actually move through a system? And so uh, there's a couple of different ways that influence uh, can propagate. Uh, one is just through timing, okay? So we already saw some examples of that with um, the H how fast a server can, an HTML, uh, sorry, an HTTP server can process uh, different kinds of pages. And, uh, and the resource contention over a socket. And then there's also, it can propagate through semantics. So you know, do different kinds of data take different amounts of time. And then of course that might, that might affect Subsequent components that also get that different kind of data, all right? And of course, you can have examples with both, okay? And so message content uh, typically affects influence, at least in the timing model, by affecting the processing time. I mean, that's, that's where the, uh, the uh, semantic content gets translated into a, an effect on the timing of the, of the logs. All right, so we just have a few experiments, and these are just uh, uh, very kind of micro benchmark type experiments to convince ourselves uh, that, that this measure actually, that influence is actually an interesting property and actually shows up uh, under lots of different circumstances and will actually, you'll be able to find influence propagating um, in lots of different situations. So here's the, here's the model and it's very simple. Uh, we'll have a source, a single source, okay, which uh, is generating work for the rest of the system. Um, uh, tasks are just uh, simple components. Okay, and then we have resources. And the thing about a resource is it has a capacity and only lets so many tasks access it at once. Okay, so a source just produces data that's passed along a channel. A task takes that data, passes something along to another task, and, and if there's a resource, then the, uh, the resource uh, mitigate, uh, I'm sorry, uh, mediates uh, how often these guys get to have access and get to run. All right. So then we're just going to look at chains of these things, all right? And only the head and the tail will be instrumented. So we'll get information about um, the, the timing of events at the source. We'll get information about timing of events at the tail, but we won't know anything about what's going on in between. We won't, we won't let our system see that. We'll treat that as a cloud, okay, that we can't look inside. And the question is, you know, for different kinds of uh, parameters and different kinds of, uh, you know, experimental setups, can we see influence at the tail that, uh, you know, based on what's happening at the source? Okay, and for what kinds of clouds, what kinds of structures in here, how does that affect the propagation of the influence? So we're going to pass some stuff down a channel, um, and we'll just watch what comes out here. Okay. 
and we'll generate the anomaly signals for the source and the tail, uh, and we'll uh, and we'll compute the cross correlation and see how much influence there actually is. All right. So what kinds of experiments can we do? Uh, well, we'll vary the chain length and the number of resources in those in those chains. Uh, we'll vary the message timing and also the effect of semantics. So we'll have two, basically two different kinds of messages, a zero and a one, and then you know, different tasks will do different things depending on whether you get a zero or a one, for example. Uh, we'll vary the anomaly strength and the background regularity. Okay, so we'll, you'll fiddle with our anomaly signals, how we compute them, and, uh, and add noise to them and things like that. And we'll do things like, uh, you know, say we didn't have all the data. Say we deleted some of the messages from the log file. Say we only got half of the log. You know, does that have any effect on this? How does that affect the influence? If we just throw away you know, some of the data, can we still detect the influence or not? All right. Okay, so here's, uh, I'm just gonna show you a bunch of graphs. Um, so here is uh, a graph of the influence uh, for this kind of experimental setup where the chain consists just of a single basic component. So just having one component in there uh, between the source and the tail, can we see what's going on? And they, it might be a resource or it might be a task. Okay, and so we varied this in a bunch of different ways. I won't try to explain all of them um, now. Uh, but a couple of important things to notice. First of all, before we did the experiment, we computed the baseline. So if we just took two completely uncorrelated tasks, you know, things that were just not connected at all, and we simulated them with the same parameters, what would be the influence between them? What would be the measure of uh, cross-correlation? Because there will be some non-zero cross-correlation between them, even just for random processes. And so that line represents the baseline. Okay, anything below that is noise, anything above that is signal. And you can see that for all the experiments, uh, we're getting some signal, okay? So there is influence being propagated. Now, this is the anomaly strength uh, down here, all right? And basically, as you approach zero here, that means the, that the anomalies are, there's basically no anomalies. As you get close to this uh, axis right here, there are no anomalies at all in the stream. And as you go out this way, the anomalies get stronger and stronger and stronger. So the timing variation is larger and larger. Okay, are we, in, I, I forgot to say, one thing I forgot to say is that we actually inject a period of anomalous behavior into the stream. So we have run this for a long time, but at one point in the stream, we actually change what the behavior and make it anomalous. Okay, so we, we, we skew the distribution of timings or whatever and to, to introduce some anomalies. Okay, so down here, uh, we, um, you know, these are extremely weak. Okay, and out here, those introduced anomalies are, are quite strong. So what this is saying, the fact that we actually get some signal, even when there's essentially no anomalies in the input stream, is saying that just the normal variation in timing is sufficient to find this. You don't even need to have really bizarre behavior to, uh, to get some signal because there's enough variation just in normal behavior that we notice that. Because even a little bit of variation in normal behavior will cause variation in the other components. You don't need to have you know, a big disturbance to the system in order to observe even some anomalies, okay? All right. Okay. Now, here are some experiments varying chain length. Okay, so just making the chains longer and longer. And again, you can see that uh, for various different configurations, we still get signal. We can still detect uh, the influence between the uh, head and the tail, even when the, the chains of components are extremely long, all right, up to 14. Actually, I guess we can't, can't see what's out at 14. So up to, well, you can see here is up to 10. Okay, so we do fine up to 10. Um, <clears throat> here we vary the regularity. Here we vary the amount of noise in the timing. So we add some noise uh, to the timing, and you can see that as we increase the amount of noise, so that regular behavior and anomalous behavior look more and more similar. You know, the yes, the influence drops off, but we're still able to detect it. Okay, we're still getting uh, a signal above the baseline. And then finally, uh, adding something to the measurement, adding measurement noise. This is a little bit different from timing noise, <clears throat> but it has a similar kind of pattern, where as you add more and more noise, uh, you know, the, the strength of the correlation uh, decreases, but uh, it's still noticeable above uh, uh, the, the baseline measurements. And finally, uh, here's the effect of dropping log entries. So if we just discard a certain fraction of the log entries with some probability, this is how much influence we still see. And the, the important thing on this slide 
is that even out here where we're throwing away half of the log entries, okay, the, there's still a significant amount of influence detected. And what does that mean? So when you throw away a log entry, that changes the inner arrival time. Because if I delete a log entry, you know, the time between the next one and the previous one goes up by a lot. All right? Because essentially there's a, whole, there's a whole event that's missing. And yet that doesn't, um, that doesn't that's not enough uh, as long as, you know, even up to deleting half of those, uh, to uh, make the influence look like noise. Yeah. 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 Just pass over each login with it, flip a coin, and, and, and discard the log entry with that probability. Okay. So what does this mean? Uh, what, the point of these experiments are just to show that influence is a robust notion. Okay. That even when there's a lot of noise, even when there's a lot of imprecision in the data, even when you, you don't have, uh, when you have a very complicated system with all kinds of, th th you know, stuff in it, uh, there's still detectable influence, you know, even across all of the, even if you have all those things at the same time, you can still find the influence of one component on another, all right? And so it should, this would suggest, actually should be useful in real systems because, you know, it's, a, it, it's not, uh, there's no simple way to defeat it, all right? And, and so there will still be some signal even if you have all these other problems. Okay, now let's talk about Stanley. So Stanley is a robot car uh, built at Stanford and, uh, and uh, used in the DARPA Grand Challenge. Some of you may know Sebastian, uh, who actually worked here at Google for a couple of years uh, following uh, this project. Uh, so that, that, yeah, the robot is the car, not the guy sitting on it. That's Sebastian, uh, all right. And I'm a little... Okay, here we go. Oops. So um, Stanley actually won this race, um, and it was it won a two million dollar prize. Uh, it drove 132 miles uh, autonomously, no driver, in a little under seven hours. And here's the big moment where it crosses the finish line. This is what you see in all the uh, press articles as it you know, as it as it wins the race. Uh, what you don't see is why am I having trouble? What you don't see are these pictures. Um, so this is during the race, and that's Stanley driving off the road. Okay, so you can see the road there is actually extremely well delineated. There's no, you know, even, even a robot should be able to see the bare dirt in front of it, and yet uh, Stanley decided that the bushes looked safer than the, than the dirt road and went off. And the question is, you know, why did that happen? And actually this happened several times during the race. Probably almost cost them the race at a number of points. Uh, and there, so there were 17 times during the race when Stanley swerved because uh, apparently it saw phantom obstacles in its map. So it builds a map internally of what sees in front of it and they could actually look at the log data afterwards and they could see these objects in the map that were clearly not there in the road. All right, and so how did those things get there? All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain the bug to you and then I'm going to explain how we can use influence to find the source of the bug or to help find the source of the bug. How are we doing on time? Not team, oh, we're doing fine. Okay, so here's what happened. So, uh, in order, you have to know a little bit about how Stanley works in order to explain this bug. So, Stanley has a bunch of lasers on top that it uses to see the road in front of it. So, and that's just normal uh, echolocation kind of stuff. So, you know, it sends out laser signals, it gets a return, and, you know, it can tell from the angle of the lasers and you now what the time was, you know, where those obstacles are. Now, the trouble is that when you're out driving in the desert or even uh, on the highway, uh, you bounce around quite a bit. Okay, so Stanley, to, to take that into account, has an IMU, an inertial, uh, what is that, what's the M stand for? What? Inertial ah, measurement, that's what the M is for. Iner inertial measurement unit that basically tells it which way the car is pointing currently. So okay, when it's driving flat, the inertial measurement is straight up, saying we're flat, you know, we're oriented correctly you know, to, to, the, to the plane of the Earth. All right, and it uses that uh, plus uh, some information from the lasers to decide whether it should keep going or whether it should take some kind of evasive action. All right, so when it's you know, oriented correctly and it doesn't see any obstacles in front of it, the lasers say everything is clear, then it can just keep driving. All right. Now, if it goes over a bump, that will change the angle of the lasers and it might see the road in front of it, okay, because now the lasers are pointing down, so it'll see stuff in front of it, but it knows at least that it's pointing up 
Okay, I mean, he knows it went over a bump because the inertial measurement unit says that it's not uh, oriented correctly anymore. And so it expects to see the road. And so even though it sees stuff in front of the lasers, it still keeps driving because it knows it thinks, well, that's just, you know, because it went over a bump and the lasers are now pointing down instead of uh, looking out to the horizon. All right. Okay, but then what happens sometimes is that the lasers uh, would, um, that it would go over a bump, okay, and then the lasers for some reason would stall. They would fail to deliver their current readings, okay. The car would return to normal position, so the IMU would say now it's pointing straight up. Then the laser data would come in saying it saw something in front of it, okay. And it would appear that the car was oriented towards the horizon, the laser saw something, and it would uh, decide to take evasive action. All right, so, so sometimes, for some reason, the laser data didn't come in at the right time, you know, at the time of the bump, and it was delayed. And so the, by the time the laser data arrived, the car was, you know, the inertial, inertial measurement had returned to where it should be, and the car thought there was an obstacle in front of it, when in fact that was just looking at stale, at stale laser data. All right. Okay, so it turned out to be, it sounds like a timing dependency, and in fact it was, um, but it's a very non-deterministic bug, it only shows up once in a while, and it took them two months to find this. Unfortunately, we didn't have our stuff ready at that time, okay, so we weren't able to help them find it, but they did eventually find it after a two-month uh, debugging search, and they actually they worked pretty hard on it. It wasn't just that they, you know, somebody worked on it part-time for two months. I mean, I think they were intensively looking for this for a couple of months. And why did it take so long? Well, so here's the hand-drawn dependency diagram of Stanley's components. Okay, so this is all the stuff in the vehicle and all the different components. And the lasers, as you can see, are up here in this corner. All right, so they're a source. Uh, and then, of course, the output is in, you know, somewhere far downstream. And there are many, many connections between these components. And so basically, they had to start at the swerving behavior and try to work backwards through the components to figure out what was going on. And that just, there were so many possibilities and so many ways in which this could have gone wrong that that just took a long time to do, you know, to narrow down and home in on what the problem was. All right, so here's what we can do. So just using what I've told you so far, um, uh, we take the, all the log files, because there was a fair amount of log data from the race, actually. And uh, we compute the anomaly signals, and there's just some anomaly signals you know, for the lasers and for the, the, the GPS uh, uh, velocity estimation. And then we build a SIG. Okay, here's the structure of influence graph with the threshold set at a particular level. And what we can see here in this, oops, in this uh, SIG are a couple of interesting things. First of all, let me just mention a little bit about the notation. There's a little bit of compression here. So when there's an edge, uh, so this gray box with an edge out of it means that there's an edge from every member of this box to, uh, to, er to the head of the edge. Okay, so it's just a way of summarizing lots and lots of edges. All right, so you can see that the lasers are in a clique. Okay, so suggesting that they all influence each other. Perhaps there's a missing component here that, uh, that influences, uh, that, that lasers are somehow tied to. And as you would expect, though, the lasers influence the planner. So the planner is the thing that makes decisions, and so information from the lasers, anomalies in the lasers, uh, precede uh, anomalies in the planner, okay? So let's, in order to help find the bug, there's one more thing we need to do. So the one thing we don't have is any kind of representation of the swerving behavior itself. So we, have, we had this behavior that was bad. And we need to somehow isolate what caused that from the rest. And so essentially what we need to do is to add another component to the model saying when did the car swerve. All right, and so what we did was we just took, you know, from the video, figured out what, ti what times during the race the car was swerving, or maybe it was, how'd you do it? Was it from the log files you did that? From the quote, okay. Oh yes, from the times given in the quote, right. So just from the, you know, the times given in the journal paper saying it swerved at this time, it swerved at that time. We just went in and added a signal that went from zero to one at that time. Okay, saying there's an anomaly at that time. So we just marked the places where it swerved in time. And then we asked, how is that correlated? What influence does swerve share with any of the other components in the system? 
Okay, and this is the thing that pops out. And the key insight here is that uh, the lasers have a very strong influence on swerve. So does the planner. But you can see that the planner anomalies uh, precede swerve and uh, actually it's bidirectional. So they have it at the same, uh, they, there's actually there's a bidirectional edge there. But preceding that and influencing the planner are the lasers, which we saw before. Okay, and there's nothing else really involved except for temp, which I'll talk about a little bit in a minute. Okay, that's the temperature sensor. All right. And this turns out to be the key insight. So this, from this graph, uh, and what I've told you, we can deduce where the bug probably is. Because it turns out that the lasers share a bus. Okay, and then when that bus gets congested, the messages are delayed. And that's where the problem was. Okay, so there's a missing component here, which we can see from the clique. Uh, that's, um, that's holding, that can potentially, when that, when that shared resource becomes uh, uh, a bottleneck, then that causes these messages to arrive late, and we can see that all these anomalies are, are highly uh, tied together. All right, so that would help, and, that cut, and it cuts out tons of other stuff in the system saying, you know, the problem is probably not there. Okay, so they tell us that this would have been sufficient for them to home in much more quickly on the bug if they had known, uh, had this information. All right, what's going on with temp? Uh, so this race was in the desert. And uh, so the temperature rises constantly during the day. And so, um, uh, so it turns out that just because of the time when they swerved, because the timing of the swerve was in one part of the race and not the other part of the race, that there's an inverse uh, correlation with the temperature sensor. Because the temperature readings were lower during the time it swerved and much later in the race when, the temperature, when it stopped swerving and the readings were much, much higher. So that's a spurious. That's a spurious correlation, okay? And, and that arises mostly because we had very, very sloppy specification of the bug. Our swerve, uh, our, our swerve component you know, was, was, was just drawn very clumsily. We didn't, really, we didn't band out exactly the points where it swerved, okay? So if we had done that, presumably that wouldn't have not been as much influence with temp. All right, so what are we gonna do now? Uh, so we've applied this to, the, as I, uh, to other races that uh, the Stanford robots have been in. Um, we've, we've looked at using this in security settings where we ask if uh, there's a correlated anomalies between, uh, say, all the web browsers on your network. Okay, so if all the web browsers start acting funny around the same time, that's an indication of some kind of uh, uh, fast propagating attack. Okay, and there's a technical sense in which we can show um, Asymptotic, asymptotic, sorry, asymptotically uh, perfect uh, 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 anomaly detection there. Um, and now we're trying to extend this idea of using, of querying these graphs, because this seems like the really, the most useful thing, the ability to take the SIG and ask questions, so like adding extra components like the swerve component and playing what if scenarios. What if something happens here? What if something happens there? What do I know about the pathways, you know, of influence? So that's our current uh, effort, and uh, we have one large data set, uh, which is some data that Adam, uh, Adam Oliner, who I, uh, is, the, is working with this, uh, is, is actually the primary person working on this. I'm just the, uh, the talking head. Okay, so Adam is here in the front row. Uh, we have one very large data set that Adam has uh, prepared uh, from supercomputer logs that we're going to try out. But what we would really like is to have more data from complex systems, and the way these kinds of techniques work, and all my experience in this kind of um, analysis suggests is that you know, the bigger the system, the more data, the more benefit that you get from these kinds of automatic techniques. I mean, you're, you're trying to boil the ocean, you're searching for a needle in a haystack, and so you need very, very large haystacks you know, to have a chance of finding a few good needles. And so we would really be interested, and the reason we came down here today, we're hoping anyway, is that somebody here would be interested in, uh, in helping us out, and possibly we could help you out uh, with the analysis of, of some complicated system if you have uh, interesting log data. And so I'll, I'll leave it there, and I think we have time. We should have time for questions. Oh, perfect, yes, we've got about five minutes left. And I'd be happy to take any questions. So um, you talk about uh, different components. You have lasers, models, and yeah. I could imagine that you could have sort of two different sorts of data sources for lasers. One is, did the lasers see something in front of them? Another thing is, were there any sort of 
flags or irregular behavior in terms of when they were reporting things, I could probably come up with a couple more. Which was actually being measured, and is it actually the case that for complaint you might have multiple streams? Right, so uh, the question was, what, um, what data was actually being gathered from the lasers in the log file? So Stanley actually had extremely um, uh, extensive log files for all of the input components. So anything that was you know, reading data from the external world, they logged everything. They logged the time and the value. And the reason for that was so that they could replay things in the lab. So they could actually replay races, try out new algorithms you know, on, in simulation without having to go out and drive again, because you know, it was... It was it was an expensive thing to go down to the desert for three days and, and gather all this uh, data. Um, and so all we're using is the inter-arrival of time of the messages. That's the only feature that we're using in all of these experiments. So. But, but I mean, I could imagine that you might have some signal where, you know, when this value is high, then that has a strong yes. influence on elsewhere. Yeah, so the question is, you know, could we, could we, um, you know, could we make use of the other data? Uh, in those logs, and certainly we could. Okay, we haven't done that yet. I mean, uh, the anomaly signal abstraction is general enough that if you have a way to map, you know, anything, any kind of signal into an anomaly signal to say, you know, what's normal and what's different, then you could just plug that in as another signal. Uh, to date, we haven't, uh, we just haven't found it necessary. And and part, and I, I went over those. Um, uh, micro benchmark experiments kind of quickly, but part of the point and some of the points I made earlier was that even uh, when you'd like to get semantic information out of these out of these logs and make use of it, um, the timing often has carries that information anyway because if you're passing different kinds of data around, things take the distribution of of timing of the log messages becomes different, and so there's an, I mean, we often pick it up that way. That's not to say that it wouldn't be useful uh, to make use of it uh, to make use of that extra data in some way. We just haven't done it at this point. Right, so the question is, you know, what, you know, would, would another way to find this, is it a question about finding the problem or about designing a robust system? Yeah, so basically if a system is robust, the kind of, if you, if you try to design a robust system and you go 90% of the survey, then what may happen, your system still has problems, but yet they're masked so heavily that, you know, the statistical calculations may not cover the really good I couldn't hear the last part, sorry. So what may happen, you know, you design a robust system, but there are still some problems. Right. It's not obvious to see that the lens goes down. Or there is a, let's say you would have a bus contention value. Mm -hmm. Then you would say, hey, I have bus contention, you know, something that's happening with my car. But now you have two components that's possible. Right, exactly. There is no correlation there. Exactly, but right. It's much harder to be. Right. Yeah, so the question is, you know, what happens. Um, Oh, well, so the, the example is, you know, what would happen if there was more redundancy in the lasers? Say you had a completely separate uh, set of lasers with their own pathway, and, and so the system was more robust to anomalies in one set of lasers versus another, okay? Um, so I'll just say that in the case of Stanley, um, I mean, this, isn't, this is not answering the question yet, so, but uh, there's, a, there's a pretty tight power budget uh, when you have an autonomous vehicle, and so you can't, you, so actually the number of lasers they had was already somewhat redundant. They had more lasers than they actually needed, but you couldn't put completely independent systems on there and stay within the, the uh, battery constraints, you know, what the, what the car is able to generate and support, because they also had a lot of other stuff in there. All right. Um, but I think, I think the general form of your question is, you know, what if there is something in there that absorbs influence? What if you have something, you know, a component that does dampen influence? So you, know, you, have, uh, you, know, you have some kind of a component that is, say, reading in from three or four redundant components and voting and then you know, uh, passing along. So yeah, so at that point, that will, that will, that will definitely cut the influence. And you won't see as much propagate beyond that point. The signal will get a lot weaker. All right? And uh, yeah, I, I guess the, the, the honest answer to that is that's something we would like to explore. I mean, how often does that actually happen? Because we... I mean, so far, uh, I would say I'm, 
I'm surprised at how well influence does propagate. I would have thought that even in the simple experiments we did, we would see more uh, problems observing influence at the end of a long chain. Okay? So my feeling is that unless you're specifically designing that in, it's unlikely to happen. Okay? I mean, the reason that you dampen influence is because that's what you wanted to do. And if you know that, then probably you can use these tools in a way that would help you, you know, confirm that that's what's going on. You know, because you know you expect to see the influence drop across that boundary. And if it doesn't, then, you know, it's not working uh, the way it should. Right? Yeah. So, so this is more of a comment, but here at Google, the, the notion of, of logs, I think, is rather different from mm -hmm. what you have on Stanley. Um, and, and here at Google, I, I'd say that what's more interesting is monitoring information. Uh, so this system is seeing this many operations per second at this point in time, and we have that over some amount of history, and you can correlate that to some underlying system and its CPU usage or its memory usage or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so so in, in terms of, of getting people to think about this, I think monitoring is, is more the, the term okay. that we would use here. Okay, sure. So. Um, so the question was, you know, there's, uh, Google has, you know, logs or, or gathers data about its uh, running systems that look very, very different from the kind of information that we get out of Stanley. And, you know, one thing about Stanley is that it is a robot. It's, a, you know, it's a real-time system. And so timing data, you know, is one of the most important things. And so you have, you know, having the fine grain timing uh, fits very well into the timing model that we're, that we're presenting, that I presented in this talk. But certainly... Um, I mean, even the kind of data that you mentioned, we could easily, I could easily imagine how you would convert that into an anomaly signal. You know, maybe, so, you know, in particular, you know, if that, if that information is being logged on a regular basis, say every minute it's dumping that into the log, then timing is not going to be the right notion. Right? You'd, rather use, you'd rather use the number of outs, outstanding, you know, whatever it was. You, know, you had a count of how many, you know, requests are being serviced or something like that in a given period of time, and you'd use that as the signals. Those numbers would become the thing you would convert into, you know, it's, it's generating, it's you know, servicing way more requests than normal or many fewer than normal, and that would be the, the basis for it. So there has to be some understanding of what was actually in those log files. Uh, but, but, but thank you for the comment. Yes, yeah, so we're, we're not interested just in timing data. I don't want to, I want to make, um, yeah, I, hope, I hope that's clear. Yeah. Okay, I think we need to stop here. Sure. I think that, that was actually okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.